So I, I'd just like to introduce our speakers today. We have Richard Pattison and Michael Baldea. Uh, Richard is a, a PhD student working with Dr. Baldea. He uh, came from uh, the Carnegie Mellon, worked a little bit with Ignacio Grossman, graduated in 2011, and was uh, Michael's uh, first graduate student. Is that right, Michael? Did you take just one graduate student that first year, or is that is what a, a part of a it ended up being five in that first year, but, but he's, he's, he's very near and dear to everybody's heart. Great. Um, and that's also the year that I started as well. Michael and I both came back from the industry, so we have a little bit of a connection there um, between our, our routes that we took. Um, but Michael, I'll go ahead and uh, just say a little bit about him. He's He's worked um, in in the process and energy systems uh, field for a number of years. As I mentioned, he had uh, you know, some some experience um, working uh, in industry and brought that experience with him to the university. He does multi-scale modeling, high-dimensional, um, potentially discontinuous systems. Uh, he works on uh, complex engineering uh, systems, um, proactive energy management for buildings. Uh, optimal operation and uh, strategic decision support, and also on data analysis, fault detection, and isolation for multi-scale systems. Okay, so with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over uh, to our speakers today, to Richard and to Michael, for their presentation on um, on these microchannel reactors. Thank you. So the title of the talk is Tuning the Static and Dynamic Performance of Microchannel Reactors. Let me know if you have trouble hearing me, but I think it should be good. Yeah, that, was, that sounds great, Richard. I'll let you know if there's any problems with the audio. Okay, thanks. All right, so our motivation to explore this work stems from the vast worldwide deposits of stranded and associated natural gas. Stranded gas is natural gas that is found in small, remote deposits that are either too difficult to get to or too expensive to export and transport or extract and transport. Worldwide, it is estimated that there are 7,000 trillion cubic feet of stranded gas, which represents about 30 to 60% of the total natural gas deposits found on Earth. Associated gas is gas that is found within oil wells. It's typically either flared or re-injected into the well because it is a much lower energy density compared to the oil, so it's not worth harnessing and transporting. In 2011 alone, Four and a half trillion megajoules, or $100 billion of oil equivalent, was wasted due to natural gas flaring. Obviously, if we were able to harness these resources efficiently, it would be extremely lucrative. However, both logistic and technological hurdles prevent the profitability of harnessing these resources. To transport stranded and associated gas, we must either build a pipeline, do liquefaction, or process the gas into a liquid fuel through fissure tropes and all of these technologies are very expensive, and current gas liquid processes scale down very poorly. In order to monetize these resources, technological advances must be made to convert this gas at small scales at the production site. The vision for my work stems from the U.S. auto industry of the early 2000s. Automakers had mastered making large SUVs and pickup trucks. The individual components like the body, the frame, and the engine are designed separately and later assembled into the finished product. As fuel prices inflated, companies began manufacturing small, fuel-efficient cars <coughs> in the same piecewise manner. This failed and eventually bankrupt Detroit. The learning was that small, economically viable systems should be designed as an ensemble of individual components, and their relationships should be considered simultaneously. The same paradigm can be applied to the chemical industry. We've mastered the design of large chemical plants that take advantage of economies of scale. The design of the reactors, the distillation columns, the utility networks are optimized component-wise and later pieced together to obtain the plant. However, the design <coughs> to design economically viable small chemical processes requires the combination of process units into efficient, intensified units with new design and control techniques at the unit level, and the detailed unit designs must be optimized simultaneously with the rest of the plant. 
This proposed gas-to-liquids process takes advantage of these intensification principles. The process consists of two steps. First, methane steam reforming to convert natural gas with steam to thin gas, followed by fischer trope synthesis to create synthetic oil products. The system is highly integrated with several mass and energy recycle streams, and the reactors are catalytic plate microchannel reactors that combine heat transfer with reaction in small integrated units. The process presents several challenges. To ensure that the system is designed efficiently, the flow sheet must be considered simultaneously with the detailed design of the reactors. Also, these reactors operate at high temperatures and pressures that could potentially harm the catalysts or present safety concerns. To make matters worse, the reactors combine several unit operations into one small integrated device represented by distributed variables, but we are only able to implement boundary control by manipulating the flow rate. We have fewer control handles than a typical process. The methane steam reforming reactor is known as an autothermal microchannel reactor because the reforming reactions are highly endothermic and, are, and must be supported by the exothermic combustion of methane in alternating channels. The channels are on the order of one millimeter thick and are separated by submillimeter thick metallic plates, and the reactors are approximately a meter long. Optimal design of these reactors is challenging. The units are complex distributed systems that exhibit highly nonlinear behavior. In the transient operation, the possibility of local hotspots exists that could potentially threaten the structural integrity of the reactors or destroy <coughs> the catalyst. Reduced link scales also prevent the opportunity for distributed temperature measurements and actuators along the reactor length. The base case for the design is the co-current operation of the reactor, which means that the flow in the endothermic and the exothermic cha channels occur in the same direction. The temperature and conversion profiles <coughs> show an increase in the flow direction, which is quite intuitive. The conversion is reasonably high as the combustion heat is gradually consumed by the endothermic reforming reaction. The co-current configuration does, however, have some drawbacks. One of them is that the feeds need to be heated the reference temperature here is 520 degrees Celsius, and the effluents are at an even higher temperature. So this requires a mechanism to, for heat recovery or feed effluent heat exchange to be implemented. So the other drawback is related to design and construction. Distributed, distribution and collection to and from individual channels is required at both ends of the reactor, which makes it difficult to build. In order to improve energy efficiency, one can envision using a countercurrent design. And the theoretical temperature profile in this case is different, where we expect the peak temperature to occur somewhere near the center of the reactor. Also, countercurrent designs have a similar construction as channel wise distribution is, <coughs> sorry, a simpler construction since channel wise distribution is required only at one end, and a collector space can be used for the effluent at the opposite end. So this design effectively combines the reactor with the heat exchange equipment that would be necessary for the co-current design. Alas, the theoretical temperature profile is not an accurate depiction. Simply reversing the flow in one of the channels of the original co-current reactor results in a significant hot spot at the exit of the reforming mixture over here. <coughs> in the countercurrent case. Basically, all of the combustion reaction mixture reacts at the inlet here, and the reforming reaction mixture does not react until it reaches this end of the reactor. So it makes for a really bad distribution of heat generation and consumption, actually. Richard, I just had a, a question about this, if I could just jump in on this one. Um, now, you'll probably be talking about this um, a little bit a little bit later in this, but. Is, are there ways that you could change the flow rate coming in to somehow equalize that, that distribution, maybe increase the flow rate of either the reactant or decrease the flow rate? Of um, the, uh, so, so no. Basically, the answer is not really. If you if you just increase the flow, we'd expect or increase the combustion flow rate. We just expect an even higher temperature peak over here, and you might be able to get a higher conversion, but paying the penalty for a higher uh, maximum temperature in the reactor. So okay. I'll, I'll get into solutions to this problem in a second. 
So the natural remedy for this heat maldistribution problem is to consider a redistribution of the catalyst along the reactor, leading to initiating the combustion reaction further downstream from the fuel inlet by offsetting the catalyst layer. So, like so right here. Likewise, the reforming catalyst is offset to ensure an optimal overlap of the heat fluxes <laughs> in the channels. We formulated this design idea as an optimization problem, maximizing the sum of the reforming and combustion conversions as a function of the catalyst distribution parameters, which is basically the length of the offset for each catalyst layer in the channel, and under temperature constraints that ensure that the reactor material is not damaged and, it, and that extinction does not occur. This is a difficult to problem, problem to solve numerically for several reasons. The model is stiff and highly nonlinear and relatively high dimensional. So here the large number of, of variables corresponds to the discretization of the partial differential equations. So its solution is required <coughs> the its solution required a novel numerical approach, both in terms of model formulation and in terms of optimization. We utilize a time relaxation based approach for solving the optimal design. <coughs> The algorithm consists of an initial integration to steady state. Then the gradients of the objective function and the constraints are calculated, and a new set of decision variables is computed. Then a new integration is performed. The conditions for optimality are then verified, and the cycle is repeated until an optimal solution is obtained. Of course, by using the reformulated statically equivalent model, we make sure that the integration is fast Static equivalence ensures that the solution is at an optimum for the original problem. An implementation of this algorithm is available commercially as part of GPROMS. Using the model and the optimization algorithm, we've, we've obtained the solution for the design problem. The optimized reactor <coughs> has high conversion at both the reforming and the combustion channels, as seen here and uh, a temperature profile that is close to the theoretical one where the peak occurs near the center of the reactor. The performance improvement can be traced back to the synchronization of heat fluxes in the two channels, with the heat generated by con con uh, combustion being absorbed by the reforming reaction that is shown here in this plot. So we see that the, the heat generation and consumption rates overlap each other along the reactor length. However, the transient operation remains problematic. If the rate of heat consumption reduces in the reforming channel, either through a smaller feed flow rate or a change in the composition of the feed, the temperature of the reactor will rise, causing potentially harmful hotspots along the link. As mentioned earlier, distributed measurements and actuators are not feasible for such a small system, and the combination of unit operations into a single unit reduces the degrees of freedom. We are left with only a boundary control approach by adjusting the flow rate of fuel to the channel. However, we may be able to improve the controllability by altering, altering the design of the system. So here we have the steady state temperature profile again, where we see the maximum temperature occurred near the center of the reactor. <clears throat> and if we experience a fluctuation in either peak quality or flow rate through the reforming channel that reduces the amount of heat consumed, we expect temperatures in the reactor to rise. <clears throat> uh, this results in this localized hotspot near the center of the reactor, which is potentially above our safe operating limit for the reactor and could cause harm. To prevent this, we propose confining a phase change material layer within the solid walls of the plate reactor. Phase change materials absorb latent heat at constant temperature when melting. This is an unconventional control approach that will prevent local reactor temperatures from rising above the melting temperature during a disturbance. A similar disturbance that <coughs> reduces the amount of heat consumption in the reforming channel will again result in rising temperatures. So now they will rise only to that melting temperature and, and they'll stay constant there until the layer is completely melted through. So the distributed controller effectively prevents the formation of the hotspot. Notice that if the disturbance is sustained, however, the layer will completely melt through. Thus, it must be implemented in conjunction with a supervisory controller that adjusts the combustion flow rate to compensate for sustained disturbances. 
BCM layer, or the phase change material layer, is in essence a temperature control device. Likewise, it can be tuned, by appropriate, tuned appropriately by adjusting its thickness. The thicker it is, the longer it will be able to withstand disturbances before melting completely. The thinner it is, the lighter and more portable the reactor will be. Unlike traditional control systems, tuning the PCM thickness cannot be done online, and therefore it must be fixed at the design stage. Since the operation of these systems is subject to fluctuating operating conditions, it is intuitive that stochastic optimization is used to tune the thickness. The typical method is to take our objective function, which in this case is the deviation of the maximum temperature from the melting temperature, <coughs> and integrate through time. Uh, an average over a large number of realizations of the disturbance space. So we used a modified approach where we simulated the reactor while implementing a pseudo-random time-varying disturbance signal that represented an unfolded probability distribution. <clears throat> we implemented a copper phase change material because the melting point is higher than the nominal maximum temperature and within safe operating limits. So it had the appropriate melting properties. And uh, so the optimization calculated a thickness of 0.56 millimeters, which contributes 18% to the reactor volume and 51% to the reactor weight. Because the phase change material was selected as a metal with a high thermal conductivity, and again, it's pure copper, the heat is better distributed along the reactor length, resulting in several steady state benefits. The maximum temperature here so here this blue curve shows the temperature profile for the reactor with the PCM, and the red curve shows the temperature profile of the reactor without the PCM. <clears throat> and we see that the maximum temperature is about 100 degrees Celsius less than the base case reactor, and conversion in both channels is slightly higher. So again, because the, the PCM is highly thermally conductive, we see a better distribution of heat uh, along the reactor length. But more importantly, the transient operation is also improved. This graph shows the temperature profile at steady state for the two reactors with the phase change material infused reactor in blue and the phase case reactor in red. <clears throat> now we'll simulate a drop in the reforming flow rate to observe the impact of the disturbance on the reactor. When the flow rate drops, the temperature in the reactors rises as expected. And in the base case, we see a quick rise to temperatures that could be potentially harmful. However, in the PCM reactor, the temperature rises only to the melting point, and it stays constant there. Now, after 700 seconds, we see that the base change material layer has completely melted through, and temperatures continue to rise to their new steady state. So this plot here shows the maximum reactor temperatures in the two reactors, during the simulation. Again, we see that when the disturbance occurs, the maximum temperature in the base case reactor quickly rises to potentially harmful temperatures. However, in the reactor with the PCM layer, uh, we see that we have an additional 150 seconds to implement a control move to reject this persistent disturbance. But again, it is obvious that a supervisory controller is necessary to adjust the flow rate of fuel to the exothermic channels to compensate for this persistent disturbance. We are able to obtain measurements of disturbances in the reforming flow rate and the reforming outlet temperature or feedback control. <clears throat> Our control system will use this data and a control law to adjust the combustion flow rate. Control law was derived using an input output linearizing feed forward feedback controller based on a data driven process model where flow disturbances are used for feed forward control and the reforming exit temperature is used for feedback control. This results in a hierarchical control structure where a distributed control layer is the thermal flywheel or PCM layer, which rejects fast disturbances, and the supervisory controller that adjusts combustion flow rate to reject sustained. To test the performance of the hierarchical control structure, we simulated the reactor during fluctuations in both the reforming inlet flow and the feed quality. 
our control variable, which in this case is the reforming uh, exit temperature, or this blue curve, tracks the set point well. However, the goal of the control system is to prevent high reactor temperatures. So this red line is the maximum reactor temperature throughout the sequence, <coughs> which is an implicit variable from our detailed model. And we see that the control system does a good job of keeping the maximum reactor temperature at or below the PCM melting temperature on all but two transient occasions. This ensures the structural integrity of the reactor and maintains high reactor conversion. Our second contribu contribution involves the development of a novel catalyst structure for intensified process system with inherently high temperatures. As mentioned earlier in the base case uh, catalytic plate reactor, the catalysts are offset so that the heat generation overlaps heat consumption uh, along the reactor length. This results in this temperature spike near the center of the reactor, as I mentioned before. The steady state peak temperature is just over 1,000 degrees Celsius, which could be harmful to the catalyst. And again, during disturbances, the temperature could rise to levels that would threaten the structural integrity of the reactor. Distributing the fuel feed <coughs> through the combustion channels would improve the distribution of heat generation and increase design and operational flexibility. However, this design is infeasible for autothermal catalytic plate reactors due to design constraints. To emulate the distributed fuel feed, we propose a catalyst structure that alternates catalytically active and inactive segments along the reactor link. <coughs> Segmenting the catalyst modulates the rate of heat generation axially, and in theory, it should eliminate the temperature spike and increase conversion. To optimize the segmentation, we formulated the problem to simultaneously select the optimal parameterized temperature profile and the catalyst segmentation that ensures close tracking of the optimal profile. Our results confirm that increasing the number of catalytic segments allowed for more precise tuning of the temperature profile. Here, the result is shown for four catalytic combustion segments and an offset reforming <coughs> catalyst layer. The plate temperature along the reactor is plotted for the base case by the red curve and the segmented catalyst by the blue curve here. Uh, the dashed line corresponds to the optimal parameterized temperature profile. So the objective function is to minimize the integral squared error between the, the actual plate temperature, or this blue curve, and the, the optimal parameterized temperature profile, which is this um, dashed line. We see that the maximum reactor temperature is 110 degrees Celsius less than the base case reactor, and conversion increases from 96% to 98% in the reforming channel. Along the top, I've plotted the optimal catalyst segmentation for the four catalytic zones. The red indicates the presence of combustion catalysts, and the blue indicates the presence of reforming catalysts along the reactor length. Notice that the length of each catalytic segment increases in the direction of propagation of the combustion flow. This is due to the fact that the combustion reaction is first order with respect to methane concentration, so as the methane is depleted along the reactor link, more catalyst is required to generate an equivalent quantity of heat. Also notice that the local temperature spikes along the link uh, correspond to the location or the presence of combustion catalysts along the reactor. <coughs> to determine how effectively the catalyst segmentation emulates the distributed feed reactor, we modeled and optimized the hypothetical reactor with multiple spatially distributed feed locations with catalysts lining the entire length of both channels. This rea reactor fabrication is desirable, but again, it's infeasible in the implementation. The top curve compares the axial uh, optimal temperature profile for the segmented catalyst reactor by the blue curve and for the, distributed, the optimal distributed feed reactor by the red curve. And the bottom graph compares the reaction propagation along the reactor link for the two reactors. The biggest difference between the profiles is the high temperature at the feed end for the combustion flow in the distributed feed reactor. So this temperature here is significantly higher. And this is 
due to the fact that zero flow is not favorable. So the optimization selects a small feed at the inlet, resulting in a higher temperature at the inlet. And this effectively is a waste of the fuel resources. But overall, the profiles are remarkably similar. And it is clear that the segmented catalyst fabrication successfully <coughs> emulates a distributed feed reactor. In conclusion, it is evident that intensification, which is the combination of several unit operations into a single device, and integration, or analyzing and optimizing the system as a whole rather than piecewise, is the key to successful small scale chemical processing. We presented several unconventional methods for controlling intensified microreactors through the addition of a phase change material layer within the plate to act as a thermal flywheel and a segmented catalyst structure to effectively modulate the rate of heat generation axially. We are currently working on algorithms to easily simulate and optimize the key detailed models of unit operations simultaneously with the entire plant, as well as several other control methods for intensified reactors. I'd like to acknowledge the financial support from the Petroleum Research Fund of the American Chemical Society, CWCCC, NSF, DOE, and to my group. And I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I'd like to welcome any questions. <clears throat> Okay, great. Well, thank you um, for that presentation. Let's go ahead and have everybody just unmute your microphone, um, and uh, we'll have some we have some time for uh, some questions. Jeff, if um, let me let you go first, Jeff. If you have any questions, I know your microphone's just a little bit quiet. Yeah, can you hear me, John? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Um, yeah, very nice presentation. Um, uh, you know, follow up most of it. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the stochastic optimization problem formulation? Did you did you just do like a discretization of the distribution, and or, or what, what can you say about that aspect? Yeah. Um, so thank you. So the way we formulated this, again, we we used the the model reactor, and rather than Simulating in parallel a bunch of different realizations of the disturbance space. Uh, we instead took the sorry uh, again. We took the probability distribution and unfolded it in time. So now we have a known as it's known as a pseudo-random multi-level sequence here, and we use that as the disturbance that was being fed to the reactor, and we integrated through time uh, for each optimization iteration. So, that, so now, rather than summing over a bunch of realizations of the disturbance space, we now just have one time integration during each optimization iteration. OK. That's nice. So, um, did you also use this? Um, you, you said optimization and uncertainty. So you fix that profile, then you sample from uh, a normal, looks like a somewhat normal distribution, and then you fix that disturbance profile and then optimize over that time varying uh, disturbance profile. Is that right? Right, but uh, it's not necessary for the disturbance distribution to be normal. It could be any disturbance distribution as long as you have a large. Okay. A large enough number of samples of the disturbance space. Okay, great. Um, okay, great. Thanks, Jeff. Do you have any other questions, Jeff? No, that's good. Okay, great. Uh, Mustafa or Randall, do you guys have do you guys have any questions? Yeah, I have two questions. Uh, the first is that uh, in one of the graphs, you show the temperature optimum temperature of fourteen eighty four and C. Have you compared this uh, temperature with adiabatic uh, flame temperature? Um, so, is there a particular slide that you're referring to? It was at the very beginning. I can't remember the number of the slide. Yeah, right, right here. So, 
the temperature is, is has to be below the flame temperature simply because you have to. I mean, some of the heat will be absorbed by the, the endothermic reaction. There's no no way that temperature can reach the adiabatic flame temperature. You can't so reach it. It, there's, there's no reason for it to do that because you already have a heat sink in place, right? So, so whatever goes on in the reforming channel is very endothermic, so a lot of the heat will be absorbed. The idea of having to do control for a system like this or the need for control arises from possible fluctuation. So if you have a fluctuation in pressure or flow or composition in any side of the the reactor, either in the fuel side or in the reforming side, um, you could end up with an imbalance of heat. So you could generate more heat than you need. And in that case, that heat needs to be absorbed somewhere. So this is where the, that phase change material layer comes into play. Okay. And have you compared the, uh, any of the temperature profiles with uh, some uh, literature uh, references? Because I had some kind of uh, same simulation as my master's degree, and uh, for a catalyst I was using, the, there was a, a large mismatch between the between the uh, experimental cell and the simulated ones. So this work is based. The key here is. There, there are three things that you need to consider when you look at the reactions. One is the um, reforming reaction kinetics, and what we use is based on a literature paper by Sue and Fremont, so that's kind of the standard for simulating steam reforming. Um, and then in the exothermic channels, you have to look at um, the homogeneous and heterogeneous combustion. And here, kind of the jury is split as to what the right um, kinetics is to use. It depends a lot on the catalyst. And um, so we use um, a mixture of what's available in the literature to model that. We do not have an experimental system. We're actually in the process of doing experiments with a collaborator and to see what's going on. But, I mean, once you have the kinetics in place, if you're serious about building something like this, then you probably do some kinetic studies first and get those into the model. And I don't expect that anything would change significantly. OK, thanks. OK, Randall, any questions from you? Uh, well, I was looking at the, um, uh, you know, you've got the uh, heterogeneous uh, Combustion with a, a catalyst for combustion, um, which we don't typically see in a conventional reformer technology. Uh, so I was, I was interested in what you what you're thinking of there. All right. So okay. So conventional reformer technology is, is what's called SMR in industry. So it's basically reforming going on in some tubes that are placed in a furnace. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, yeah. Where you got catalysts on the reformer side, but not on the combustion side. Yes. Correct. And then, so there is just a uh, flame on the, the combustion side. So the problem with that is that a lot of the heat that's generated in that furnace is basically wasted away. So here, if you have heat sink, so reforming and heat generation in close proximity, your thermal efficiency is a lot higher. So there are catalysts for homogeneous or heterogeneous combustion. It's basically a flame flameless, highly exothermic reaction, so it's the oxidation of methane on a catalyst. It's usually a platinum catalyst. And um, the problem is that that reaction is very fast. So it's a, it's a combustion, but it's flameless uh, in a way. So because it happens so quickly, then you have to make sure that you start that reaction at the right point along the reactor so that the heat generated by that reaction can be absorbed on the other side. Um, so that's the principle there. Yeah, OK. That's helpful. So uh, the, your biggest challenge is uh, certainly managing temperature, but also cost of the overall system. Um, 
Yeah, I think cost becomes manageable if you're careful about manufacturing. Um, you have to think of the, the increase in efficiency as part of the overall cost of the process. Yep. Okay, great. Um, well, thanks, thanks, Randall. Um, so, Michael, I just had a, a couple of questions about how you, you formulated this. Um, and and you mentioned you were using G-PROMs, is that right, or were you using GAMs, or what was the platform you were using? We've used G-PROMs for all these. Okay, G-PROMs. And I understand G-PROMs is very good, you know, with simulation, um, but, but typically with optimization, um, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, I've, I've seen some other work where, you know, once you get to very large-scale systems, it, it has a little bit more difficult time. How how'd you guys, what did you guys have to do and, uh, to be able to optimize this? And what were your experiences in using VPROM? Okay, so I I would, um, see that, that's a good point. And generally, you have to be very careful how you formulate the problem because you can probably fool any solver that you're using. So scaling, other things that, that that become important when you have a very large problem, a very small problem for that matter as well. Um, so what we found that helped a lot was this, um, this time relaxation algorithm. So where we converged everything in time. Uh, and that helped a lot with the stiffness and the high dimensionality of the reactor model. Um, and then the other thing was to, to do this uh, stochastic optimization, do it as a, as a basically identification-based optimization where you use a, a signal from system identification to excite your, um, your process in the right way in order to explore your disturbance space. And that way we didn't have to run a lot of models in parallel. We just ran one for a longer period of time. And with that, we saved a lot of... Um, Getting horsepower. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought that was an interesting point that you had there. Um, be able to reformulate that in a way where you could get still a deterministic optimization, uh, but get somehow some of the nature of the stochastic nature of the of the disturbances in your in your model. Um, I, I, yeah, good. Sorry, we have a couple ahead. of papers in that area as well. So one of them is considering chemical, considering chemical engineering, and that's still under review, and then one for the Cyan paper that we're going to submit pretty soon that, that really fleshes out the theory of, the, of doing this. Okay, great. Um, Jose uh, joined a little bit late. Jose, do you have any questions um, for, uh, for this group? Uh, no, I, I wasn't able to see the whole thing, but I was seeing something about uncertainty, but I didn't get to see that the whole part. Okay. Well, Jose's, uh, part of Jose's project um, that he's working on is optimization under uncertainty, um, particularly looking at 30-year you know, time horizons with energy systems. So um, he, may, he may want to get in. Uh, Jose, after we post the video, you may want to go back and, and view what they're doing with stochastic systems and... Mm -hmm. and uh, that may spark some more discussion um, offline. Yeah. Um, okay, great. And and Michael, can uh, I know you have a big role in the AICHE meeting coming up. You wanted to say a little bit about um, what you're doing with CAS and and uh, some of the activities uh, that are coming up in just a couple weeks. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I was the programming chair for the CAS Division 10B, so the Systems and Process Control part of the AICHE. And um, it was very a very, very good year, I would say, in terms of people submitting high-quality papers, um, getting a lot of sessions. So our number of sessions is now, I think, up to 16 or 17, so from the initial projected of about 10. Uh, we had a very, very heavily oversubscribed year this year, and I think there's a lot going on in the area of uh, systems and process control. So make sure you check the schedule if you're at the AICHT San Francisco. Um, also, there will be a CAF plenary, so computing and system technology plenary uh, presentation on Monday morning, and a very high-quality poster session as well. So if you're around, um, please stop by, and 
uh, I think you're in for a treat this year. So thanks for letting me talk. Yeah, and, and thanks for organizing that. It looks like a great program this year, so I'm excited to uh, to go and see that. Okay, well, great. Well, thanks, everybody, for, for logging on. And, and um, let me just mention briefly um, what we have for our next session. Um, let's see. Let me go ahead and share my desktop here. Um, so we have a couple. Uh, we have Wes Cole, also from UT Austin. Uh, he's going to be presenting. Let me make this just a little bit bigger. Um, he's going to be presenting on uh, grid management to predictive residential air conditioning control. We have uh, advanced deep water monitoring system, CEO of Astro Technology, um, and then uh, Jacob Reynolds. This is the uh, nuclear uh, project out at Hanford uh, Hanford Nuclear Reservation on uh, some multi-component predictive methods. Yeah, UAVs, and then next year we have more of an optimization focus uh, with uh, Bob Four and Northwestern, Martha Grover, Georgia Tech, uh, Jeff Kelly is joining us, and then Jeff Jeff Renfro, uh, who's on the line here from Honeywell Process Solutions, as well as uh, Carl Laird. So we have more of an optimization flavor for this next year, um, and uh, we're continuing the next few weeks with um, more of the uh, process control. Um, and modeling uh, themes. So, anyway, thanks for joining, guys, and um, I'll uh, I'll send you guys an update on the next uh, the next sessions.